away from them. And we would like to welcome her and to thank her so much for taking time out of her busy schedule to come and speak with us. So if we could just welcome her. Why should I be a leader? 
And the, the answer to that question is, if you don't do it, who else will? You're the only you that there is. You are the only people who are representing the students in the osteopathic profession in the kind of leadership capacity. There are membership organizations, but you are representing every single student in the osteopathic profession. You are represented very well on the AOA board by our student representative, Amber Hall, but she can't do it all. You all need to be involved in leadership all the way through. Uh, we, I was very heavily involved in some of the work at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, where we had six doctors and six nurse practitioners talking about the scope of practice. If the doctors hadn't shown up, how likely is it that the nurse practitioners were going to present our point of view? We're the only ones who can present our point of view. You are the only people who can present your point of view and how you look at things. I will, I will share with you a pet peeve of mine. People will tell you, and I think you'll hear this going forward at times, you are the future of this profession. I absolutely disagree with that. You are this profession. You, from the minute that you matriculated in DO school, you are the osteopathic profession. People come up to you and say, oh, you're in medical school. Why did you decide to go to DO school instead of MD school? Tell me about your school. You are the face of the osteopathic profession right now. You are the osteopathic profession right now. So why you should be involved is who else is going to tell your story because who else knows your story? Okay, what types of leadership, the second thing, what should you be involved in? Well, certainly you're already at exactly the right place. This, the Council of Interns and Residents is a huge place for you to be involved next. Um, the New Physicians in Practice Council is certainly the next place. We developed this a couple of years ago while I was AOA president to be sure that we are engaging that, that next group. But much more importantly, when you're in practice, you need to be involved in whatever area it is, in wherever you are in practice. What, what um, faith-based organization that you are in, you need to be involved. What sports-based organizations are in the area, you need to be involved. You have standing as osteopathic leaders. That's going to be even more important when you are in your community. People look at you as a physician in your community, as someone who has in the top <coughs> one or two percent of level of education in the entire world. So you are looked at as someone who has standing. And the other point that is the reason that it's important for you to be involved is, how many, anybody here speak French? Okay, I'm in a little trouble then, because I'm gonna say a French phrase, so if I say it right, if I don't say it right, tell me how. No less of wish. Is that close? Okay, well he's just being nice. <laughs> it means, to whom much is given, much is required. I will make the point that every single one of you is going to be graduating as a physician, at least as far as I know, and you are getting there for two reasons. One is that you've worked incredibly hard, absolutely incredibly hard. But lots of people in this world work, work really hard. People who are you know, cleaning the floors and serving the lunch and work really hard. They didn't get what the second thing that you got, which, which is a gift of native intelligence. You took that and you built that into really something wonderful, but that was a gift that you received. So you, you did not create that. You did not pick your parents. You got that gift of native intelligence. You made it work. You need to give back. Because lots of other people 
who worked so hard never got that gift. They didn't get it, they didn't have the, the fortune to be born by, from the people that, that bore you and raised you. So you need to give back. It's very important for you in your practices as leaders to also be involved in politics, in the legislature. They constantly comment about the fact that the legislature is going to do something regarding you and your practice and your scope of practice and your ability to do what you want to do. And you can be there and have an input into it or not, but they're still going to make all those laws and rules. And I hear sometimes people kind of go, politics, ew, you know, I mean, that's just so tawdry. That's just, I don't really want to get involved in that sort of thing. Molière, did I say that right? It's a, it's a French author, many years ago, said, politics is sort of like the air. You may not like what it smells like, but you cannot choose not to breathe. So you've got to be involved. You have got because they're going to do things that affect you, regardless of whether you are participating or not. So the last thing that I want to speak about is the how. How do you become better leaders? You're already leaders. You're already doing things right now that distinguish you highly. And I would have to take a, a moment to say. Um, a word of congratulations to two of our award winners last night. Give them a round. Stand up.
Learn it and live it. The, the most important thing after learning how to be a good uh, leader is to live it. And I know people who have taken all the classes and done all the right things, but then they went out on the living it part. Because you got to do, it's okay to know what every, the right things are, but you got to do the right things. And that's one of the most difficult things to do as a leader is when it's not popular and when the person that you're going to have to work with needs to hear some things that they're not going to be real pleased about. But you got to do the right thing, which leads to the fact that you got to do, sometimes you got to do the hard thing. There are a lot of things changing right now that are influencing your educational career, the practice of medicine, um, your, it can go as high as the Affordable Care Act, and it can go to the, to the front lines level of a physician in your practice catchment area um, that is impaired, but everybody likes. And somebody's gonna have to do a hard thing and say, no, you should not be taking care of patients. Yeah, we all like you, and yeah, we all enjoy getting together. You are not doing the right thing by continuing to stay in practice. You gotta do the hard thing. The other thing of the living it is do the osteopathic thing. Now, I don't want you to misinterpret that. I don't mean that you have to take an osteopathic internship and an osteopathic residency and an osteopathic fellowship and practice in all with only osteopathic physicians. That's very yesterday. Today is you are an osteopathic physician wherever you are as soon as you get your degree for the rest of your life. I hope that you will select osteopathic training, and I hope that you will continue to utilize your osteopathic manipulative skills. But the point that I really want to, to hone in on is when you get that degree in, in a matter of months to a couple of years, depending on where you are, your last name is always going to be D.O. And that is a, that is, and Taylor still said that no prouder name can you carry. So no matter where you are, no matter what kind of training situation turns out to be the best for you, and again, I hope it's osteopathic, but it doesn't have to be osteopathic. And whatever employment situation it is, I hope you, have, you are blessed to be able to work with osteopathic physicians. But even if you're not, you're the ones who can carry the message about the osteopathic approach and the osteopathic philosophy to our MD colleagues who are very interested in that approach and to patients. So do, to me, doing the osteopathic thing is, is remembering your roots and always reflecting back on that. So I want to wrap up my comments and then take questions about referring back to my grandfather. I told you he was the second of 11, and what I didn't tell you was when he, became, when he was 11, he became the oldest, because his older brother uh, had a, a bad, he has, my grandfather would describe, he had a bad belly ache. And the doctor came to their home and my great-grandmother dripped the ether and put him to sleep on the kitchen table and the popular thing was doing an appendectomy. And when they opened, and my grandfather at 11 was standing there watching all this. And when they opened him up, his appendix was fine. And they sewed him up and the doctor I don't, again, this is very, very third hand, but oh, well, when 
when they talked about it, he had probably been eating too many green apples out of the orchard, and that was where the belly ache was. But it was a popular thing was everybody wanted to do appendectomies. And that, that young man who was 14 um, died of sepsis in his home. And my, that, that, didn't, that didn't scar my grandfather. He didn't carry any ill will. But the lesson that, that his approach to that taught me even more was that when I decided to become an osteopathic physician. I wanted to be the kind of doctor who did, who made my own decisions, who followed proper protocols and didn't get wrapped up into what was the, the thing, the item of the day. And I, I could step out and make my own decisions and go my own way and make my own assessments of my patients and what was best for them and do the right thing and not and not be swayed by other things that were going on. And the thing that I learned, as I said, most, most importantly from my grandfather is one person can make a difference. One person, but even more importantly, one person must make a difference. And that is my message to you. You are the profession. It's in your hands. You must make a difference. So we have some time for questions. If you have questions, you can come up. There are many 
pluses and minuses of having <laughs> for this profession of this size now, 30 schools in 40 locations in 28 states as of six weeks ago, and a bunch more schools in the pipeline, and more than 35 students in, in school in the United States in the DO school. There's been a huge shift. Uh, Dr. Polk spoke this morning about the book called The Tipping Point, of when all of a sudden uh, everybody knows about this new thing and wants this new thing. We are, we are very, very close to the tipping point. So the, the challenge that is going to be ahead of you is helping our allopathic brothers learn more about the approach that we train you in that is making you such successful physicians. So, I mean, how can you ignore the fact that the body all works as one entity? And some MD schools still teach that way. That it, it really, it just doesn't even make sense. So they're coming to our, and many of them already are there. Many of them are already there. You will be leading that much closer interaction that's happening all the time. That's the difference for us. Joe Anderson, University of Medicine. Thanks for stopping by today. Um, and kind of your question led perfectly into mine. It seems like in our generation, it's very, I mean, I think that you chose osteopathic medicine so specifically. Um, so many of us apply to both MD and DO schools, and even though we may have had, you know, prefer uh, to, to be at a DO school, we, we don't want to be physicians. Um, and so how do we kind of deal with students who maybe are on the other side and maybe wanted to be MD and still have that stigma? Um, and how do we, you know, a lot of them say, well, why, you know, why do we have to separate ourselves? Why can't we just, you know, help the MDs learn the great things about osteopathic medicine and kind of collaborate with them in that manner instead? And then that's a really, really good question. I would say that the arguments are not that are carrying the day are not at the student level. They're at the old guys level, at my age, um, who haven't seen that, uh, didn't grow up that way, didn't learn that way. And okay, they may just have to die off. Okay. <laughs> so at in every in every class of osteopathic students, there have always been students who say, well, I guess I'll be a DO, I guess I'll be a DO, but I won't tell anybody, and I'll just be a doctor, and it'll be just fine. Um, people change over time. I have seen people who came in with that philosophy come in, oh, okay, I'll tell you a story. I don't have the email with me, but um, I got this email May 7th. And I can't, I, I don't have it with me, but um, it was from one of my grads from 2008 who uh, went, who is finishing up an emergency medicine residency and is finishing up a emergency medicine ultrasound fellowship and said, uh, sent me an unsolicited note and she said, she said, I know you never expected to have heard from me. But she said, I'm an emergency physician, and I had a patient come in, and she had this excruciating back pain, but she did not have any history related to that, and she did not ask for any pain meds. Now, if you've been in the emergency room, you know that those two comments do not go together. <laughs> Patients do not come to the emergency room for excruciating pain and then say they don't want pain. So she was really puzzled by this and did a whole physical examination and history and there was nothing in the history and the only thing she could find was a tender point. So she said, in her email, she said, so as with anything I don't know, I looked it up and I got out my Chapman read points and she said the only thing it confetti or what it connected with was a gallbladder and pancreas and she said, I would have not otherwise run any lab. But because of that, and this whole circumstance, Remember. end of the story, she had gallstone pancreatitis. 
And she said, I just wanted to tell you that I was a person who was pretty un unsure uh, why I had made the decision to go to DO school. And I didn't really see it had any bearing on what I was going to do as an emergency physician. And she said, let this give, to tell your students, give them hope that even training in an allopathic institution for a non-osteopathic specialty, I have now come to realize the value of my osteopathic education. So maybe they'll, maybe the people you're talking about will graduate and say, I still don't get it. One day, they may, and that's okay. So, uh, Alan Runner, Sator, from New York. Uh, thank you so much for speaking with us. Uh, my question goes, I think one of the important aspects of being a leader is uh, being able to engage others to lead as well our peers. Um, down the road, going to our physicians and working and hopefully one day starting families, uh, I think leadership might take a backseat to life, right? Um, how do you foresee us um, encouraging others, our peers, those around us, and even our, ourselves to stay involved when life kind of takes over? Um, it's okay to have a life. That is all right. Um, you, when you first get out of practice, you're going to have to get your practice up and running. That's okay. But let me, if I can make one comment if, uh, additional to what I have, is how many of you have taken Myers Briggs? Okay. Or DISC? Enneagram? Strengths Finders? There are a whole host of things that help you better understand. If my point is, and I would recommend it for you, my point is, if you are a leader, you can't help but be a leader. And, and I would take a quick, totally unscientific statement based on the fact that you are all sitting here, that you've got the leader gene. So, and there's no such book about it. <laughs> that you, life will go on, but being a leader is not something you go force yourself to do. You can't not do it. So you'll you'll be fine. <laughs>